Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Well, right now I'm alone. Uh, Brother Jason Cripps is going to be joining me in a minute. Uh, I sent him the link. RL, uh, Brother Mike, if you're listening, I emailed you the link also. Uh, our regularly scheduled uh, program tonight was uh, Sister Renee and I would begin the uh, Bible study of the Book of Romans, but I I, I don't know where Renee is. Uh, I I'm when and I can't reach her on the phone, so I'm worried. Um, I tend to worry. I hope that uh, Lord help me not to worry. I know worry means uh, absence of faith, but uh, I worry about the people I care about uh, if they're missing. So. Um, I hope she's okay because, uh, you know, this is a, a regular program every Wednesday night and I haven't heard from her. So that makes me wonder if something's happened to her. Uh, so uh, uh, when uh, Brother Cripps joins me, we'll start the program. Uh, I don't know what we'll talk about yet, but uh, sniff. Okay, let me just look at the chat room right now. Okay, Sarah Jane, yeah, that was nice visiting you in the fellowship room today. And uh, I look forward to much more of that in the future. Uh, looks like we got Brother Cripps here right now. Hi, brother. Hey, brother, good to see yeah. you. Well, you, you said that you'd like to fill in whenever possible. So uh, I, I, I was just telling the audience that um, uh, Renee uh, and I were going to start the study of the Book of Romans tonight, and uh, she's she's here every Wednesday night unless something prevents it. Sure. But she always lets me know if she's sick or unavailable, and I haven't heard from her, and I she hasn't answered the phone, uh, so that makes me worry. And I know that Jesus said, "Don't worry," <laughs> but I, I I worry about the people I cut care about when they're uh, I'm, I'm worried that there's something that's happened. So everybody, let's pray for Sister Renee that she's safe and okay, and perhaps it's just some um, some explainable problem that it's not a big deal. Uh, okay, Brother Cripps, uh, say hi to everybody and tell them who you are. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Cripps, and I'm happy to be here to tonight. And uh, I have a channel that I'm part of, which is uh, True Story Live, and we come on Sunday nights. We'll talk about that more later, but. Um, I'm, I'm so glad to know brother Luke and we've become friends and brothers over, uh, over well past six, there seven months. Is. There he is. There she is. <laughs> Sorry. My computer like froze. I was downloading one of Watchmen needs PDFs and it messed my computer up. So I was having a hard time rebooting it. I'm sorry. We're just glad you're okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jason. I was, well, I was worried about you because I, I called and didn't get an answer. And uh, so I uh, I thought that you were not going to be here tonight. And I invited Jason to come on just to fill in since you were not going to be here. But Oh, no, no, no. You know, I'd always call you. My son had the ringer down on the phone. And I was over here meddling trying to get it to work. So I, I just tried to get to you as fast as I could. I'm so sorry for holding you up. That, that's okay. That's okay. I'm, I'm happy you're here. I'm happy you're okay because I was. I've told everybody that one of my weaknesses is worry. And, oh. Uh, if uh, somebody is missing and I'm, I'm expecting them, it doesn't matter if it's a program or just uh, you know in, in here locally. If uh, I, I immediately start worrying, are they okay? And I, mm. I should be more. Uh, uh, trusting that, that, that the Lord's protecting us all, but uh, I can't help it. That's my one of my faults. <laughs> I, I was doing a video to give him the link, you know, and I uh, ended up talking a couple minutes because I was watching this uh, investigative journalist from People Magazine. He did a series on Christian cults and the damage. Some of them were turned out to be violent and evil, you know, from the 70s and 80s and like the Yahweh nation and, you know, the black Hebrew roots movement, they got real militant and it was really crazy. And I was so disturbed and I was thinking they all have the same thing in common. One is a, a loopy leader that gets worse and worse and eventually calls himself God, uh, all claiming to be a prophet, all have dreams and visions. They always belittle women. They have underage brides. There's lots of polygamy. And what do they do? Work for salvation. It's all about repentance from sin and the old Testament. 
bits and pieces of the Old Testament. And so I was like, maybe we could do a show on that sometime going over some of these lesser known cults and how dangerous it can be. I see people on here starting churches, building wooden cabins, telling people to move out there. And this very charismatic leader who's a work salvationist, by the way, claims to be able to cast out demons, but says that uh, he's not, people aren't saved yet and that Christians can be possessed. It's just really dangerous because Although it may come out a little bit harmless at first, it can get really weird. So, you know, I see a lot of these people on YouTube claiming to be prophets with their dreams and visions, and they're all unbiblical. People need to test spirits. So maybe we should have a show on that sometime. Yeah, well, we just glad to do it. Uh, you know, we have a plan to uh, begin uh, teaching the Pauline epistles. And it's just starting with Romans 1 1 and working our way through it one verse at a time. And, and uh, I was planning on, on beginning that tonight. Um, if you think it's, uh, you know, we'd like to talk about a different topic and start that next week, I don't mind. Uh, but Or we can just do it, go with plan A. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Fine. Uh, all right then. Okay, so we have Brother Cripps here with us and we'll get his thoughts as we go through this uh, study of Romans. It's going to take us. To get through all the Pauline epistles, I expect this series to take uh, a year um, or more. Uh, we're not, we're not going to be in any rush. Uh, we're going to, as I said, go through it a verse at a time. There's various ways to study the Bible, uh, and I have um, I have a, a various playlists on uh, types of Bible studies. Some are, are are character studies where we look at a uh, a, a person like Adam and Eve or, or uh, Joseph or, and that's one way of studying it. Another way of studying is topics, uh, you know, whether it's, let's say, Bible translations or, or uh, you know, eschatology, how end times going to play out or, you know, you can study topics, you can study characters, but another way, of course, probably the most common way is a uh, verse by verse commentary and that's what we want to do here is go through these epistles, one verse at a time. We might read two verses at a time occasionally. <laughs> well, I but, love doing that because iron sharpens iron. You always get to see what others see, you know, that yeah. you don't. Yeah, and, and I, no doubt, I have no doubt that as we go through them that uh, we'll, we'll have little different takes on different things. I, matter of fact, I expect it to be a different take right off the bat for uh, ch chapter one and two. But what I'd like to do first is um, we're going to have our take on these scriptures. Uh, but I'd like everybody watching to uh, let, let's see um, when we study the Bible, we want context, but context is not just what is the verse before and the verse after say context is the, uh, the, what is the entire chapter about? What is the, what is the entire book about who wrote it and how does that fit in with the whole context of the Bible itself? And, you know, contact can be really narrow or very, very broad. But I'd like to, for us to look at this. Uh, let's first consider what is the common per perception of the book of Romans. And I looked at it today. You know, see this? I, you probably didn't know this, but I'm actually the smartest person in the world. As long as I've got this smartphone. <laughs> of course you are. Any question you want to ask me, I can. I can and you're the you best answer. singer ever. <laughs> so Speaking, speaking of best things. I'm sorry to interrupt, Brother Luke. Can I say something real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Speaking of best things ever, Renee, I'm so happy finally to be on a show with you. I just want to say that it's not hero worship, but I so appreciate your ministry, and it was instrumental to my walk. That's all I want to say. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be on. I'll just be in the background, guys. Don't mind me. Oh, no, honey. I, I well, so well, you're here. Brother well, Cripps, you're here. One. And you're Thank participate. You. I'll call on you to participate. Yeah. As well myself. So uh, I don't want you to be just a, what is it called when you're sitting, oh, like a sitting? Wallflower. A wallflower. No, you're not yeah. a wallflower. <laughs> Third <laughs> wheel. You're jumping in the pool, buddy. The water's fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I'm not but, scared. <laughs> you know what you said about Sister Renee, brother? You know, if I was a jealous person, it would bother me because uh, uh, I hear on a daily basis. Earlier today, I heard a couple of people talking about this. Yesterday, I hear people talking about this. Renee, 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 she's been, she changed my whole life. And, and I'm just so thankful 
for I'm saying that now. I am so thankful for Sister Renee. She has helped so many, and she's going to do continue to do so much good to uh, uh, open up the eyes to the world about the free gift rather than working for salvation. Just receive it as a gift. She's you're very very loved and appreciated, Sister. And Amen. You're another, another fan of yours, Brother Cripps. Yes. Oh, you guys are too funny. Yeah. Okay, so what would we find out if somebody just says, hey, this book of Romans, what's that about? Let me see. Um, okay, Google, what is the book of Romans about? According to Wikipedia, the epistle to the Romans or letter to the Romans, often shortened to Romans, is the sixth book in the New Testament. Okay, now that wasn't very much, but I did this earlier today to see what I was going to say, and it gives me quite an essay on it, so I want to just read a little portions of this, and I'll get your feedback. Before we get into the verses itself, because this would be, you know, understanding when it was written, who wrote it, what were the circumstances, who it was written to, all that is um, a, a foundation. I think a person, if they understand that before they start reading it, it's, it can be very helpful. So let's let's see what... It says in on the internet here, it says the epistle to the Romans or letter to the Romans, often shortened to Romans, is the sixth book of the New Testament. Biblical scholars agree that it was composed by the Apostle Paul to explain that salvation is offered through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the longest of the Pauline epistles and is often considered his most important theological legacy. Um, I've got more to say, but I'm, I'm more to read on this, Ed, but I love, I'll get your feedback. Let me tell you first, my, my first reaction to the book of Romans uh, is that when I, um, I, I, when I learned about um, the, um, the uh, timelines of all the events in the Bible, particularly uh, in the church age, uh, I was amazed. It was revealed so much to me to understand exactly when things happened and how how far apart each event was spaced apart. It changes everything uh, when you understand that. But if if I had my way, I would not make Romans uh, in the Bible where it is. I would I would put it farther down um, uh, in, instead of the first epistle. Uh, I'm not sure what order exactly, but it wouldn't be the first epistle. And as we go further in our talk, you'll understand why I, I don't think it should be the first epistle that we read of Paul's. Uh, but okay, so this uh, is telling us that it was Paul who wrote it, and um, and that it's uh, it's about uh, justification, salv uh, salvation. Uh, so, what's your thoughts on that? Just re react to that. Uh, how about Crips? You first. Justification and salvation. That's okay. So my, you heard me read my favorite Bible verse ever, Romans 5, 1 through 8, right? Mm -hmm. Justification is, is everything. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely everything. Okay, so it said it's the sixth book. So we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, Renee, what is your reaction to what I just said? Do you have any opinion when I said I don't like the order of the epistles? Well, I mean, I figure God preserved it for his, you know, whatever his reason is. And we can see in Acts where it kind of moves away from Judaism and starts to kind of understand and going away from the temple worship into moving to point toward the Gentiles. And Romans is both to Gentiles and Jews. I like Romans because it also explains, you know, that God's not done with Israel, that he still has a plan for them. And Romans 11 is a great place to show that the church does not replace the nation of Israel. Uh, uh, to many people's dismay that hate the Jewish people, that hate Israel. But we're supposed to pray for them, as you know, uh, for their eyes to be open, because if we're blessed in their blindness, how much more will their fullness bless us? So I, I, it, I like the epistle because it goes, it's speaking to both Jews and Gentiles as one body, but then also addresses 
uh, that the Jews will be brought back to God. They are temporarily blinded. Uh, at, but right now, this is the time of the Gentiles. Uh, and uh, until the fullness of Gentiles come, and then it's going to be reverted back to focus on bringing Israel to the Lord. So um, I, you know, it's hard to, to, I bought a book called the Chronological Gospels a while back to see the Gospels as uh, they would have occurred in chronological order, even breaking down the four Gospels of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and his ministry, lining up what happened when, because it's kind of hard to, you know, see it when it's not in chronological order but i'm i mean i'm sure god's got his reason for why he put it there but again i'm like you i don't read the bible from beginning to end i read this and then i go back to that and then this reminds me of something in the old testament and i go read that prophet so i don't read it in order anyway so yeah, yeah i i want to make sure everybody, uh, does not misunderstand because often People hear me and they get the wrong impression, and then I misquote it and stuff. I'm not saying the Book of Romans should not be in the Bible. Right, right, I get you. Don't even let even think I'm saying that. Right. I'm just saying the um, the canon was determined that these are the books that will be in the Bible. Okay, I don't disagree with that, but I'm questioning the order that they are right. presented by right. the publishers. The publishers could have put them in any particular order. Now, I don't know if the there was a church council. That decided the order i don't know like the old testament the last two books it's a bizarre thing to have them at the last instead of like zachariah or something mm -hmm. think like zachariah yeah. or one of these end time prophets would be at the end and what is it uh chronicles or something yeah and, i don't remember the order of the all the so, old testament, but. you know that's bizarre but i mean i guess god's got his reason i i think there was a council on it because Every Bible I've seen has the books in the exact same order. Yeah. Well, obviously, at some point, there was an agreement to put them in that order. Uh, but I, I've studied church history and the the uh, uh, the all the various uh, what they call um, uh, what's the word for a worldwide council ecumenical. They had these ecumenical councils, and then they would uh, they would uh, discuss topics and then come to an agreement and then make it canon, saying this is the orthodoxy of the church and at one point they were discussing which books would uh, be a uh, part of the canon and but i don't recall any discussion about the order i don't the know was not his first stop it was one of his last stops yeah yeah we're going to get to that next here we're going to yeah. go through at this little intro here period uh yeah. you know when it was written and chronologically it would be better to see his earlier writings first and then you can see how he grows in grace and in revelation yeah. Yeah, you know? but my that's that's one factor. But the other reason is I have a, a a reason that I'm withholding because I as we go through chapter one and two, I want to make some points that, that you'll you really understand why I think it's not a good idea to start with this one. Oh. But I'm going to keep you in suspense for that part of it. Let me okay. do a little bit more here. OK, it says um, the general presentation is in the opinion of Jesuit. Oh, oh Jesuit scholar Joseph Fitzmaier. The book overwhelms the reader by the density and sublimity of the topic with which it deals. The gospel of the justification and salvation of the Jew and Greek alike by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ, revealing the uprightness and love of God uh, the Father. Um, N.T. Wright notes that Romans is neither a systematic theology nor a summary of Paul's life work, but it is by common consent, his masterpiece. It dwarfs most of his other writings, an alpine peak towering over hills and villages. Not all onlookers have viewed it in the same light or from the same angle, and their snapshots and paintings of it are sometimes remarkably unalike. Not all climbers have taken the same route up its sheer sides, and there is frequent disagreement on what the best approach what nobody doubts is that we are here dealing with a work of massive substance, presenting a formidable intellectual challenge while offering a breathtaking theological and spiritual vision. So that's kind of like an overview in the, in the Wikipedia's of uh, this person's opinion. Uh, and I certainly think this idea of, um, when it says it near the end here, that it is, um, uh, 
presenting a formidable intellectual challenge. Uh, and again, as I express my point of view on some of these things as we go along, you'll see why I think I think that's the case. Uh, Brother Cripps, uh, give me your thoughts on that broad uh, statement about the Book of Romans. Um, I'm having trouble. A broad statement about uh, I Romans is probably one of my favorite books in, in Scripture, and I would agree that it is his masterpiece as far as I'm concerned. Um, I I am not sure that I see that there's any problem in the order if that's what you're getting at. I apologize. I missed the when you asked me before. I thought you were just asking for a general comment about what what I like about Romans. So I went into the whole thing about uh, Romans five one through eight. So I apologize. I didn't understand the question. That's all right. Well, if you want to tell us more, you, you don't think the order is a, is a, a factor at all. But, no. Uh, okay. As we continue this study, I'll, I'll try to um, explain further why I think. It, and it, uh, the hint is here in this statement I just read that it says that it is a um, um, formidable intellectual challenge. Now, I think we'll all agree, even without even taking much time to think about it. Look at Romans 9. Do you know the argument about Romans 9? I mean, the Calvinist, non-Calvinist view, it all rests on how you understand Romans 9. And then you got Romans 1 and 2, uh, where when we get into those, there's some subjects that's being discussed there that uh, are going to be very uh, very uh, challenging to make it, make it all make sense. And then when you get to Romans 3, of course, those are the, the verses that we use most often in our in our uh, evangelism message. So there's a lot of, um, it is very theologically, uh, there's a lot of things that um, various camps of theology will, will pull something out of out of Romans and uh, make it uh, like a, a foundation of their, their uh, niche. Uh, okay, authorship. It says, um, the scholarly consensus is that Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans uh, the denial of Paul's authorship of Romans by such critics is now rightly relegated to a place among the curiosities of New Testament scholarship. Today, no responsible criticism disputes its Pauline origin. The evidence of its true of its use in the apostolic fathers is clear. And before the end of the second century, it is listed and cited as Paul's every extant early list of New Testament books includes it among his letters. The external evidence of authenticity could indeed hardly be stronger, and it is altogether born out of the internal evidence, linguistic, stylistic, literary, historical, and theological. Um, before I read that, uh, I was not aware of any dispute over the authorship of this book. Uh, have you heard of that? And and do you under do you, do you aware of any dispute as to who wrote Romans, Renee? Uh, that's retarded because he clearly says that he is a he is a Benjamite and tells about his own personal history. And then besides the fact that the opening line is Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, it's like the first line of the letter. Uh, and then. Uh, I don't know why they think somebody faking in his name when his writing style is very clear as he always uses Old Testament scriptures to confirm the New Testament covenant. So I, I don't know. There's too much personal information about Paul in this letter for it not to have been written by him. I never heard anybody dispute the authorship. I've heard Hebrews being disputed. Oh, yeah. Hebrews is uh, Hebrews is uh, there is no consensus at all as to who wrote Hebrews. Uh, be even between the three of us, we might have different opinions. But uh, okay, uh, Brother Cripps, uh, have you ever heard any dispute about who wrote the Book of Romans? Uh, no, frankly, I have not heard one single thing about it. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's patently ridiculous. I agree with what Renee said. Well, according to this, it says that the denial of authorship of Romans by such critics, in other words, early on, there were critics. There was a time when his, this authorship was challenged. But in my lifetime, I'm, I'm not aware of it. So this must be an ancient argument that has long since been settled. Now, let's, the next point is dating, okay? The letter was most probably written while Paul was in Corinth, 
probably while he was staying in the house of Gaius and transcribed by Tertius, his Amma Nunsis. Now, Amma, Amma Nunsis, if I click on that, it'll tell me what that means. I looked at it earlier. Where is, why isn't it? It's not telling me. But uh, Amanusis is someone that uh, is there to either sign your name for you or write for you. Uh, it says, there are a number of reasons why Corinth is considered most plausible. Paul was about to travel uh, to Jerusalem on writing the letter, which matches Acts 20, verse 3. Maybe you can find that, Rene or Cripps. Uh, Acts 20, verse 3 says that he was on his way to uh, um, Jerusalem when he wrote this or and stopped in Corinth where it is reported that Paul stayed for three months in Greece this probably implies Corinth as it was the location of Paul's greatest missionary success in Greece additionally Phoebe was a deacon oh sister Renee yeah I know the word uh, dianokonos or something in Greek is always translated deacon except for the one time it's used for a woman. Then they translate it minister or servant. Yeah, I saw a video. I, I intended on sending it to you uh, a couple of days ago. Some other uh, woman made a video and she was talking about this and cited this and I wanted to send you, but I, I forgot apparently. I, yeah, I don't it, even fight these men anymore because no matter what proof I show them, they want it to be true. So I don't even bother. Like they want it to be true that God can't use a woman. Yeah. And so I, I don't even bother with them. I don't yeah. even bother the argument. If they don't want to take the time to understand the context of those verses and to realize that Paul had female workers, apostles and disciples that worked and fought for the gospel with him. Yeah. It's clear they explained the gospel more excellently to this one guy. You know, if they don't want to see that and take the full counsel of God and want to take one verse out of context, when I did show them what those verses mean and how it all worked together, they got angry and came at me and there's no point, you know? Yeah. It's clear that they translated deacon to another word because it's a female, but they made a mistake because the name Junia is female and they treated her as if it was a male. So they didn't cover hers up. I can comment on that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> That's something I know a little bit about, and I agree with Renee totally. It's it's time to get over this idea that women women can't um, teach the Bible. It's so archaic, and it's complete and total nonsense. And uh, I did bring that verse up if you uh, want me to do anything with that. Yeah, please read it to us. Acts, uh, it's, it, we should get the impression of where Paul is when he wrote this. Yeah, absolutely. You want me to read from uh, verse 1, or you start at 3? Uh, read the context if you if you think it'll help. Yeah, man. After the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him and the disciples and that embraced him, and departed for to go to Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece, and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he proposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia Sapatur of Berea and of the Thessalonian, sorry, Thessalonians, um, Aristarchus and Secundus, I think, and Gaius of Derbe and Timotheus and of Asia, Tychus and Tropimus. Uh, uh, these going uh, before tarried for us at Troas. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So uh, it, Phoebe, it was a deacon. And Paul, uh, Paul wrote this. Uh, it says, uh, on his way... Uh, let me see, probably implies current as it was the location of Paul's greatest missionary success in Greece. Additionally, Phoebe was a deacon of the church, a, a, a port to the east of Corinth, and would have been able to convey the letter to Rome. 
So they're putting forth the idea, and I've, I've heard this before. Um, as we go along here, I'm going to introduce an idea uh, called prosopopoeia. I have a playlist on that subject, but uh, I'll tell you more about what prosopopoeia is. But uh, Phoebe pl plays a, a, a part in this, uh, the prosopopoeia, because, well, I'll, I'll tell you about that when we get to that point. But uh, so Phoebe was the one that was suggesting here I think it's commonly believed that she was the one that was carrying the letter to that church and therefore would also be the one to read the, the letter to the church. Um, after passing through Corinth and taking a ship from Corinth's West Port, uh, Erastus, mentioned in Romans 16, 23, uh, also lived in Corinth, being the city's commissioner for public works and city treasure at various times, again indicating that the letter was written in Corinth, so, uh, you know, we have the Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We know all about them, uh, if we've, everybody who's studied the Bible. So it seems that uh, it was written in Corinth before uh, and then sent with Phoebe to, to uh, be delivered to uh, the church in Rome. The precise time at which it was uh, written is not mentioned in the epistle, but it was obviously written when the collection for Jerusalem had been assembled and Paul was about to go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. That is, at the close of his second visit to Greece, during the winter preceding his last visit to that city, the majority of scholars writing on Romans proposed the letter was written in late 55, early 56, or late 56, early 57. Uh, early 55 and early 58 both have some support, while German New Testament scholar Gerd Ludemann argues for a date as early as 51, 52, uh, or 55, 54. Following on from Knox, who proposed 53, 54, Ludemann is the only serious challenge to the consensus of mid to late 50s. Now, before I read this, my studies on the writings that, that when the various books were written is that uh, this was written very late in the 50s, probably 58. Um, and of course, we know that, uh, for example, uh, the exact timeline for all the books we can go over, but I know that uh, James was the first one written and then Galatians was the next one written about eight to 10 years before uh, Romans. Um, okay, so Renee, uh, the date that it was written and the fact that it was written uh, in Corinth, sent by uh, Phoebe to, to Rome, uh, d how do you think, is that pertinent and important to us to understand at all? Well, I mean, regardless of who physically wrote it, it's obviously in the form of Paul's voice. Uh, and since the Holy Spirit is dictating all of this anyway, uh, I, you know, I, it doesn't really matter to me too much. The only reason I like to know it's Paul is because I know he's constantly contending for the gospel and that he is the apostle to the Gentiles and does not mix any of the law at all. And Peter and John and James, they're they're speaking to Hebrew believers. And so they're going to come in a uh, from a Judaistic works, legal tradition way of speaking to them. And that confuses a lot of the Gentile believers because they don't understand the context. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like when it's clearly from Paul because I know he's not going to cause that confusion. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter, you know, to me as long as we we know if, if it was one of them writing on behalf of Paul or whatever. Uh, it it wouldn't really matter because I, I know the voice is going to be the same, you know. Okay, well, this says that some manuscripts have a subscription at the end of the epistle. I wasn't sure what a, a subscription was, but it is, it'll become clear. Uh, it, that it various, uh, it's written in Greek, so I, but they translate it says, to the Romans, it was written from Corinth, unquote. And then another one says, to the Romans, it was written from Corinth by Phoebus the deacon. Uh, that, then, that see, I could see the church hiding that. I could see the church hiding that um, because they really wanted to be a patriarchal. They they love the patriarch thing, and they're going to try to limit women as much as they can. And that's why they hang on to those one or two verses they think are, 
you know, making us unusable. Unus so I guess that's very interesting uh, to see that. But see, Paul had that eye problem. So it's possible he literally needed someone else to write physically for him. Although he does ask for parchment so he can write letters when he's, uh, I think he's in jail and asked him, please don't forget the parchment. Uh, so so. I, was, I was unaware that uh, some of the manuscripts have this subscription at the end to say these things. Another one that says that there's one, some manuscripts have this one. It says the epistle to the Romans was written by Tertius and was sent by Phoebus from the Corinthians of the church at Centres. Um, so that's a little bit more, a longer explanation of uh, uh, that uh, Tertius wrote it, but right, Paul had him write it because he couldn't write or see. Or you'll you'll never have a pastor say Phoebe was a deacon. They're going to cut that yeah. right out. Yeah, and, and but but it was and it was sent by Phoebe uh, mm -hmm. from the Corinthian church, and then the, the uh, last one it says that uh, uh, to the Romans it was written from Corinth by Phoebus, the deacon of the church in Centres. Mm -hmm. I, I was unaware of that. It's uh, amazing. A, lot of these, a lot of these old manuscripts have that at the end of the letter. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so Paul's life will, in relation to his epistle it says, uh, I don't want to go into all that, the Church of Rome, the purpose, the purpose of the writing. Oh, no, let's go to style. I want to see what it says about style. Scholars often have difficulty assessing whether Romans is a letter or an epistle. I thought that was the same thing. A relevant distinction in form critical analysis. A letter is something non-literary, a means of communication between persons who are separated from each other, confidential and personal in nature. It is intended only for the person or persons to whom it is addressed and not at all for the public or any kind of publicity. An epistle is an artistic literary form, just like the dialogue, the oration, or the drama. Uh, it has nothing in common with the letter excerpts, it, its form. Apart from that, one might venture the paradox that the epistle is the opposite of a real letter. The contents of the epistle are intended for publicity. They are aiming at interesting the public. Brother Cripps, were you uh, were you aware of the difference between an epistle and a letter? I thought it was epistle just meant letter. <laughs> yes, uh, that's what it means to me, and I know you have a point, but I'm I'm desperately waiting because uh, all this seems to be uh, beside the point to me. Well, I think it's uh, helpful to uh, to get a a, um, a context of uh, all these things, the historical setting, where where it was written, who it was written to, what, but uh, all of the things that we're discussing here, I think can help people uh, get a, lay the foundation before you, you read. I think that's a good idea, no matter what book you're, you're taking on. I thought epistle was a letter too. Yeah, so it is. interesting. If there's a, if there, there, there is an accurate distinction, a letter is personal to, from one individual to another, it's intended to be private. An epistle is something that's written for the public to, to, to be read to the public. And that's as we, that's that goes right along with the idea when I introduced prosopopoeia to the discussion that uh, that's uh, that's how it was intended to be read, not just given to a church for a pastor to to read, but to be read by Phoebe in the way Paul instructed her to read it. Um, okay, I'm happy to hear that though. Yeah. Okay. The purposes of writing. Let's see what it says about that. To review the current scholarly viewpoints on the purpose of Romans, along with a bibliography, see this and that, William Tyndale. Um, this epistle is the print is the principal and most excellent part of the New Testament, according to Tyndale, uh, and most pure Evangelian. Uh, so he thinks it's the most evangelistic uh, uh, book. Uh, that is to say, glad tidings and what we call the gospel and also a light and a way in unto the whole scripture. The sum and whole cause of the writings of this epistle is to prove that a man is justified by faith only, which proposition whoso denieth to him is not only the epi this epistle and all that Paul writeth, but also the whole scripture. So locked up that he 
shall never understand it to his soul's health. And to bring a man to the understanding and feeling that faith only justifieth, Paul proveth that the whole nature of man is so poisoned and so corrupt, yea, and so dead concerning godly living or godly thinking that it is impossible for her to keep the law in the sight of God. Usually, wow, that's interesting. Tyndale wrote for her to keep the law. Usually uh, when they use a, a preposition like that, they'll use him. Like speaking about humanity in general, it's always masculinized, but he, he said her. I, I, that was a, stood out to me. Well, uh, I mean, aren't they, are, uh, her would be, churches are always feminine. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, one last thing here. Let's look at hermeneutics. Uh, no, I, that's about uh, those. All right. I guess that's enough of a foundation. Uh, we don't want to bore everybody too much. But I do think to the viewers, this little exercise, um, Brother Cripps, maybe it wasn't valuable to you. That's okay. Uh, but I do think that it's wise um, to learn some of these facts about the book before you, you decide to take it on. That's part of understanding the context. Uh, I think some of the problem is uh, I'm just the new guy here. So when I have listened uh, as an audience member, you guys really get into the word. And so that's what I thought I was getting into. Uh, yeah, we're going to right now. yeah, no, no, I, I totally understand. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Uh, when you were saying that, I, I didn't mean that it was ridiculous for you to bring it up. I was trying to say that w some of those points they're making were a little off. That's all I meant. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, unless uh, either of you want to say anything else in a, in a way of an introductory statement about this book, we'll get into the text itself now. I would like you to get into it on my end. Okay. All right. Then let's start reading it here. Um it begins, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Um, I'm, I said I was going to read this one verse at a time, but but Paul has a, like, he's known for having run-on sentences, long sentences with a lot of commas. And I think we're going to have to read a few at a time in order to even complete the thought. So I'm going to read uh, more than just the first verse. Okay, so it says, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name, among whom ye are ye uh, also the call to Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, all to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know I'm going to jump on that section where it says, made according to the flesh, of David, because these people denying the pre-existence and divinity of Jesus, they love verses like this because they don't take the full counsel of God. They'll deny the divinity verses, the pre-existence verses that he was here before the world was. He created the world. He's called God. Uh, and right here, it, it's a perfect example of how, because Jesus is called that holy thing. Do you remember? He said that holy thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it, He's the mystery of godliness the incarnation of god himself so um that is uh it can be used to support his divinity but those that want to deny it could easily take that verse concerning his son jesus christ our lord which was made of the seed of david but see i see according to the flesh again his humanity had a beginning and but him as a spirit pre-existed but he was made, that spirit was made into the form of a man. And he's of the seed of David, according to the flesh. That's why Jesus asked them, hey, how can David call him Lord if he's his son? And they're like, who? Huh? Because huh? it's a carnal concept. 
it, it's a high spiritual concept that he pre-existed. He's David's Lord, but yet he's a descendant of David because one is of the flesh and one is of the spirit. So I just wanted to point that out because uh, they can use that to try to prop it up that he was, see, he was made. Yeah, but that doesn't mean as a spirit, he didn't pre-exist. Mm -hmm. so I wanted to say according to the flesh is a very key point there. Okay. Uh, I have, I've talked about the different types of um, studying. Uh, you can study from a character standpoint, a, a study about a, per, a particular person in the Bible. You can study on a, about a particular topic, like salvation, or like hell, or like the creation, whatever your topic is. And then there's this idea of studying it a verse at a time. I've done numerous studies on my own, verse-by-verse uh, -verse commentaries. I did uh, um, Acts, Galatians, um, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job. N none of those other books did I have a problem with going one verse at a time because the points were succinct. But with Paul, as I just said, before I even read this, I said Paul's style is uh, really, really long sentences that are, it's a, uh, He's known for it. And here they run on and on. They run on. <laughs> yeah, there's seven verses. And it's only one period. The rest of it are just commas and semicolons. This is all intended to be one thought. But look, seven verses um, before there's a, a period. Now, I, I imagine that the punctuation, of course, was not part of the first letter. So I, I don't know if that uh, changes everything. But Brother Cripps, uh, Okay. What are your thoughts on the content of that and also my point about how we're going to have to read chunks of verses and, and rather to, to get the complete uh, sentence in? Oh, yeah. Uh, chunks of verses is fine. Um, that works for me. Uh, just making sure that we cover every part of it. Absolutely no problem whatsoever. Sounds good. Um, as to the portion, uh, first, what Renee said, I want to agree with that. Uh, absolutely. The, the the, the whole spirit uh, versus flesh thing that people try to make a point of is uh, ridiculous as well. Um, so, so far, so good in, is, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Uh, all right. So we read seven verses, but I don't want to skim over it that quickly. I, I want to take as much time as we need to go even a word at a time if need be. So let's start off. The first word is Paul. Uh, you know, in that introduction, we were surprised when it said that there was a point where uh, the, the scholars were arguing about who wrote this, and yet it begins with Paul. A That's what I was laughing play. about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't understand how there could be any question unless uh, uh, it says Paul, a servant of God, it's talking, it's going to go on to talk about Paul, but it's not talking about Paul. It's Paul talking about Jesus. Uh, so that doesn't make any sense at all. So Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Uh, what's another word for servant? Minister. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I think it's important that uh, Paul is a servant or a minister, but Renee's a minister. Uh, Cripps is a minister. I'm a minister. Are you a minister? Whoever's watching, are you a minister? That means are you serving God in some way? Uh, this is something that uh, I think that, unfortunately, the Roman um, cult, Roman Catholicism, they've made much of the world think that that the individual is not a minister, that they're what they call laity. You're just laity. And, uh, oh, forget about the Bible. You can't, you're not qualified to have a Bible or read a Bible. We need this class called clergy to read it and study and teach it to you. Uh, but the point is, we're all supposed to be servants or ministers. And I urge everybody, if you don't have a ministry, you God is calling you to do something. Uh, maybe it's different than what I'm called to do or Renee or uh, Brother Cripps, but there is something God has planned for you to do to serve him and to serve uh, the world. And uh, if you don't know Amen. what to pray. Lordship preachers hate Paul. You'll hardly ever hear him preaching from an epistle of Paul. 
You won't hear John MacArthur preaching from Paul. You'll hear him preach from the four gospels and James and first John and second Peter, but you won't hear him preaching from the Pauline epistles. And there's a big fight against Paul. There's people out there saying he's a false apostle. Why? Because they want to be work salvationists. They want to be justified by works. So I'm glad we're sticking with Paul. We defend Paul because people are saying, is Jesus or Paul? Well, Paul's words are Jesus's words. And I, I just think that's a silly argument. The, the issue here is dividing uh, what was being dispensed. And, and Paul clearly says the grace is being dispensed right now. So I love that we're reading Paul. And you will not hear these preachers preach from these epistles. You will Paul, never hear say, for him that worketh not. Yeah. You know, you won't hear it. Paul's writing is the basis for my salvation. Amen. Absolute Amen. basis for salvation. That's right. Okay, so... I, I have said this. People probably have actually gotten very tired of listening to me at this point. But the correct position is usually right here. And then you have extremes of it going each direction. We have the Apostle Paul. I happen to believe that he's probably the most important and influential of all the Apostles. Uh, um, so that's how I see the Apostle Paul. I think that he his his distinction is that he said, Jesus told you, and John told you, and Peter told you, believe in Jesus for salvation. I'm telling you that's true, and I'm also adding to it, you better not add any works to it or you've ruined it. That's the, that's the contribution Paul makes primarily, is taking it a step further. I call it ratcheting down. Faith alone in Christ alone, okay? Yeah, believe in Jesus for your salvation, but not only that, don't add anything else to it, tightening it down so there's no wiggle room, nothing else but Jesus. And so that's really what Paul uh, Paul did. But we have these factions. Some people elevate Paul even above Jesus. They say you can't even be saved by the words of Jesus. Uh, you know, uh, other people argue you can only be saved by the words of Jesus. They're red letter uh, believers. Only you can the, be saved by all the word of God. You can be yeah. saved by the Book of Genesis. Yes, but then now that you have so some people say. Uh, Paul's words are the only thing that matters. These are hyper dispensational Paul onlyists. And then you have other people that say Paul was a false apostle. But guess what? It's not a new thing to call Paul a false apostle. In his own epistles, he's defending himself from the accusation over and over again. That's why he said, examine yourselves. You seek proof of Christ speaking in me. Examine yourselves that you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, uh, you, uh, you you taught me on that verse. Uh, I I understood it to mean that uh, um, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Now, if I take that out of context and just look at it by itself, I could easily say that examining yourself to see if you're in the faith means uh, examine what you believe. What is your faith? Are you believing in faith alone? Or are you believing in faith plus works? That's how I've always understood it. And then other people say, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith, if you're by your works, if you are you doing enough work to uh, examine yourself in that way. So that's the heretical way. But sister Renee, I thank you. You gave me the context that I didn't, I didn't put it together. And the idea that Paul is uh, answering the charge about, well, he's a false apostle and he's saying, well, if you think I'm a false apostle, you better examine your own faith. You're not even saved if you if you got saved by a false apostle, you know. Let me tie this point in, too. Think about where you'd be if when you ran across Renee in the first place and you decided that you weren't going to listen to her because she was a woman teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I shudder to think of it. Yeah, it's... Uh... Well, fortunately, we have a, uh, a, a great congregation, not only the Church of the Eternally Secure, but thousands of other uh, viewers or uh, of uh, subscribers of uh, Renee's channel directly who may not even know about me or the Church of the Eternally Secure. But, but, and yet uh, all of these people understand that they can learn from a woman. And they're, they over and over on a daily basis, we are told that this woman opened my eyes to the true gospel. So it's, it is a, it is another point. I, we, it's interesting that uh, we got into that tonight, but right from the beginning, Phoebe being a deacon 
and uh, that issue had it came up i was laughing because in the chat room one guy's like oh you can use a dumb ass to speak uh but can't use i was like yeah literally that's that's where that we are on the totem pole with them i guess but uh uh, it's the reason I, I, I make sure people understand that examine yourself first, because I don't want to give any false profit, any ground to say, Paul is saying, look at yourself to see if you're safe. And so if they were uh, interpreting it like you did, that would be fine. But even that gives them the foundation to twist it. So I want them to 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 say no he's saying no examine yourselves because you are in the faith it's i don't know what that type of writing is when they're giving a uh like a backwards thing like i i can't explain it but uh, he's saying you are in the faith obviously and since i'm the one that brought you the faith you can prove me your faith confirms me as an apostle because christ is in you and i'm the one that brought you the message that had Christ in you. So, you know, um, I, I wanted people to, because right like two or three verses before, he says, so you seek proof that Christ speaking in me. And then he says, examine yourselves. So it's basically like, hey, you want to examine me, examine your own self. Yeah. Are you in the faith? Unless you be a reprobate. Because I, you know, I brought you a thing. I, that's the only reason I make such a point of that. because like that Paul Washer sermon, his whole foundation was wrong. Examine your works. If you don't have works, don't save. But if you don't have the works, you're going to hell. All based on a false foundation and twisting in the scripture. And Ray Comfort uses it on almost every message for way of disaster. He always, oh, God says, make your calling and election sure. Examine yourselves to be in the faith. By your fruit shall be known. None of that in context at all. And if somebody didn't know better, it would shake you up. Well, we all know what false prophets do. It has to be out of context. Yeah. Otherwise, the people would realize that they're false prophets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, these a lot of things you just said there are going to really be pertinent as we go along. The idea of the false teacher, uh, the idea of a thorn in the flesh, uh, Brother Bill told me, and I, I ended up agreeing with him on this, that the uh, the thorn in the flesh uh, could very well be the um, Judaizers that followed Paul wherever he would go and establish the church and teach him the uh, free gift salvation. And then Paul's gone. The Judaizers would come in and say, Paul's a false apostle. That's why he had to keep defending himself because he kept going in and saying, he's a false apostle. Don't listen to him. You got to also practice Judaism and believe in Jesus. And so uh, uh, the thorn in the flesh was the idea that these people are being a thorn in my flesh. Everywhere I go, they're trying to ruin my teaching and accuse me of being a false apostle. Um, and the other thing, of course, is the idea you said you don't know what the word for it is. Maybe it's a, a literary technique. Well, when I get to the point where I start talking about prosopopoeia, that's also a literary technique that is probably unique to Paul as far as the Bible. And it is, uh, but it was very common in uh, at that time in history within Greek, the Greek uh, educational system. They used it uh, to uh, to make a point. Uh, but Paul, it also should be understood that Paul, he was born and raised Jewish, but he was a Roman citizen, but he had a Greek education, so he understood all the Greek philosophical writings and, and all the Greek uh, techniques of oratory, and, and he uses that, just like when he was talking about those uh, false gods, uh, where was that, where he talked about the, the false gods and the one the unknown God, and, and uh, he was able to use uh, their own philosophy to, you know, as he said, I can do all things to all people. Well, at that point, he was speaking like well, he was one of the Greek philosophers. You were talking about thorns in the flesh. It could have been them. Hey, it's very, very possible uh, because my friend Paul calls them the people that come against me constantly, my Brillo pads. They are shining up my message, getting it refined. You yeah, know, yeah. it's aggravating and annoying, but it it refines the message so you know god yeah. can use all things for our good well you know the the, the bible is uh 
you know, it does have some words that are very graphically dirty, you know, when it talks about uh, fecal matter and stuff in, in very descriptive ways and, and different things. So it can be graphic. It's not intended to be vulgar. Uh, but uh, in this case, thorn in the flesh is kind of a polite way of saying, that guy's a pain in my ass. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> like people who are being a pain in your ass. They're right. trying to ruin your ministry. So you know, buff at him. The same thing. He had these guys who were the pain in his ass or thorn in his flesh who are trying to bring him down as an apostle. That makes sense because it said to buffet me lest I get uh, con conceit in his own revelation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, let me uh, go a little bit further. We got we read seven verses to make one sentence, and it will. Uh, so he says, "A servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God." Okay, now here's something that uh, I think I may have a different take than than others uh, when we get to this separated unto the gospel of God. But let me get your thoughts first, Brother Cripps called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of god what does that mean to you uh okay a uh, servant of jesus christ called to be an apostle called by god to be an apostle jesus uh specifically you know uh, on the road so we know about that separated unto the gospel of god i'm not sure what that means to me um all right other than what it says, separated unto the gospel of God. Oh, separated from a previous belief. Is that is that what it's referring to? Well, I'm, I'm, I'll give you my opinion, but let me, okay. ask, let me ask Renee first to give me her thoughts. Is that, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to remind everybody, it says many are called, few are chosen. I, I believe the Calvinistic view of calling and election is wrong. I think the one verse, according to the foreknowledge of the Father, it clarifies it all, saying he knew the end from the beginning. He knew who would, by free will, receive his offer. And so he called us all, but we are the elect according to that foreknowledge of the Father. He knew that. And so we're chosen to serve. So each one of his that he's called that have received it, he chooses for their specific path. And I think Paul was called just like all of us many are called he said i will draw all men unto me so many are called few are chosen so many are called few are chosen for service is what i believe not chosen for salvation i do not believe that it it, de it defiles the character of god Amen. so uh uh i believe when he is separated unto the gospel uh it it is uh he is you he is only his only purpose in life is this gospel he is set apart from all things of the world his family his old religion that he counts all dung all his knowledge of the law everything even his identity uh he's set apart and called for the specific purpose of this gospel that that's what i i kind of felt mm -hmm. all right well the um we are uh reading the KJV. And I, I think that, I don't know uh, Brother Cripps' uh, position on this. I haven't heard it, but I'm, um, I know that Renee and I will use the KJV as our scripture. We trust it. We rely on it. Uh, and then there are some people in the viewing audience that are um, take it a step further and say, only the KJV. Don't even think about looking at but anything else but the KJV. Well, that's okay as long as they're not that are not imposing that on me. Don't take away my freedom, my right to look at another translation. But I, I want to look at the KJV first and then compare it to the others. And if the others contradict the KJV, I'm going with the KJV. But if the others can help me understand the KJV a little bit better, I, it can be helpful to me. If you don't want to use it, that's your decision. Uh, but the um, I am uh, I like to use the amplified translation uh i'm going back and forth turning my fan on and off because ever since my back surgery four years ago my body temperature hot and cold hot and cold is crazy i'm like a woman woman in menopause <laughs> um okay so uh, i'm going to as we go through this study i'm going to read it in the kjv but also let's look at the amplified the reason i like the amplified is that 
uh, even though sometimes it's wrong, just like many modern translations, they, they will misinterpret what repent is and, and add in some uh, repenting of sin. Uh, for the most part, it's good, but you know, it's easy to see when it's wrong. But on the other hand, the amplified is doing exactly what the name implies. It's amplifying. And isn't that what you're doing, Renee? Aren't you amplifying on the scriptures? I say, tell me what that means. You're amplifying yeah. your, your opinion about yeah. what it means. I'm just amplifying, putting uh, what I believe it says uh, uh, to clarify what the correct context and meaning is. And yeah. uh, I, I am a King James preferred, but there are a couple of literal translations that are pretty good that are real close to the original Greek and Hebrew. Um, but these new versions like NIV and yeah, these are not right. They take away scriptures. I mean, entire verses. They change the Lord's prayer to like four lines. They, they add things like of your sins to the word repent, which completely adds works to the gospel and, and causes confusion. They'll put things like change your heart and lives and believe. It doesn't say anything about changing your life and your heart and believe in scripture. It says, change your mind and believe. You just crucified the Lord of glory. Now, repent of that and believe on it. So uh, these are just wrong. Now, I believe God can use anything to get somebody saved. But uh, the, the King James preferred. I'm not a dogmatist. I'm not going to say, you read that, you're a heretic. Because I believe that God wants a person saved, that they can see God's truth. You yeah. know? I think that's a good, healthy uh, viewpoint you happen to have there, uh, probably, because it it's, agrees with me. <laughs> Brother Brother Cripps, what, do you have a, any uh, position about uh, this uh, KJV and uh, looking at other translations? I do. Delighted to answer this one. I, I grew up with KJV, and I memorized uh, scripture uh, all throughout my school years from KG, KJV. Um, and then my... Uh, I was in churches where they didn't use uh, exclusively the KGV, and I never even thought it was any any issue or problem until later when I realized that people were saying that their the other versions had uh, you know uh, parts of it that had been taken out and 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 things like that. Um, my overall stance is for me personally, I only use the KGV. Um, unless I'm really studying a passage of scripture and then I, you know, I'll bring it up on the computer and I use the, uh, strongs and, and stuff to really parcel it out. But, um, I just want to make this one point. God can use anything to, uh, invite someone to a relationship with him. And that does include scripture. Someone can be saved from any, uh, version of the Bible, in my opinion. And then once they get saved, if, if I had anything to do with discipleship, I would lead them toward KGV, KJV. That's my that's my stance. Yeah. Um, well, sometimes I look at uh, Young's literal, so you can see what each word literally tr translates. It's, it's almost like going to the Greek because it translates one word at a time, literally. Uh, but however anybody wants to do it, I, in my opinion, you're free. If you need my opinion, I say you're free to to do it however you like. Um, but when when we do compare, uh, we can see where either the Amplified or any other translation, we can see where it, it, it gets away from the KJV. In that case, we can see how mo some modern translations are seriously wrong. Um, but the reason I bring it up is I'm gonna read some uh, of it right now as from what we've covered so far. It says, Paul, a bond servant, and say, it has footnote A, uh, let me look down here, it says, uh, a person in bondage, one who belongs to another. So this is supposed to be servant in that respect where uh, Paul's considering himself a bond servant. His, his life is, is as a servant of Christ, uh, called as an apostle, and as it says, special messenger, personally chosen representative. Uh, then it says, set apart for preaching the gospel of God, the good news of salvation. And this is the part that I wanted to make a point about when, when I said, what does it mean when it says call, uh, separated unto the gospel of God? Um, I've talked a lot uh, about how, um, you know, in the early church history, and, and as we see it recorded in the book of Acts, and then we look at the book of James and Galatians and, and Romans and all, see all these uh, and compare it and try to try to fit it together and see 
this whole storyline, the sequence of events, you know, uh, in the order that they happened and how long the dispute over what really is the gospel. Uh, uh, is it only Jews? Oh, no. Gentiles are included. Well, don't they have to become Jews, too, now and get circumcised? Oh, no, they don't have to do anything. That was a process that took like 30, 40 years to gradually get through that, um, uh, changing it uh, to, to what the way we understand it right now and the one that, way that Paul championed it. Uh, but I believe that this idea of being separated, as Paul says here, uh, separated unto the gospel is because he was separated from the other apostles. He was a totally distinct uh, person compared to the Jerusalem church. The Jerusalem church, you had James and Peter and John and, 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 the, and, and the rest of them and the, the church, all the church leaders in Jerusalem. And they didn't ever teach uh, preach to the uh, the Gentiles until 10 years after Pentecost. Peter gets a vision and goes and is told to go to Cornelius. And so the first Gentiles hear the gospel and they start getting saved. That was 10 years. It was only Jerusalem, only the Jewish people. They didn't, they didn't know and they didn't even certainly didn't desire that Gentiles need to be incorporated. We need to bring them in as equal members of the church. There was a lot of racism and uh, se segregation and uh, prejudice. Jews were not al allowed to associate with Gentiles. When Peter, when it was found that Peter went to Cornelius' house, Peter was chastised for that. You can't go into a Gentile's house. Can't associate. What you ate with a Gentile? What you even told preach to him? And so see, that kind of attitude was the attitude that was in Jerusalem, and uh, so when they finally reached the point, many years later, ten year ten years after Pentecost, they have these Gentiles coming in. Ten years after that, this twenty years after Pentecost, you have the Jerusalem Council, where Peter and Barnabas go to Jerusalem because. Their apostles were being told, you got to get circumcised, you can't be saved. So Peter and Barnabas, they said, we're going to Jerusalem and straightening this out. That was 20 years after Pentecost. So for 20 years, this uh, incomplete understanding of what this gospel really was, it's for Gentiles too. And you don't, you don't mix Judaism with it. That had to be straightened out. And, and so, so when they finally agreed at the Jerusalem Council, okay, Paul, okay, that's fine. We understand uh, you want to you go to the Gentiles then and we'll we'll go, focus on the Jews. James, Peter, John, that was what their their intention was. They're going to focus on the Jews, even though Peter had preached the first the very first one to preach to the Gentiles. Peter was the original apostle to the Gentiles, but he really and the others were focusing still on the Jewish people. So they were, I believe. And according to Aaron Budgen, uh, he took it even a step further than the way I understood it. He he says when they tell Paul, to, oh, go ahead and be the apostle to the Gentiles and we'll focus on the Jews. They were basically had the attitude, that's good. Let's just get rid of Paul. Let him go waste his time on the Gentiles and we'll focus on the Jews. So I think that when Paul says he was separated, uh, uh, separated unto the gospel, uh, I, I think he was probably really thinking he was separated from the other apostles, sent off and to focus on the, the, the Gentiles. And, uh, but Paul, of course, he, we know that he still had the, the, the routine was every city he went to, he'd go to the synagogue first because he never stopped loving his own people and wanting to tell them about Jesus. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but the, to me that separated stands out like a sore thumb because of the way I see this. Uh, Renee? Give me a second. I want to look through that. Okay. Uh, um, Brother Cripps, anything to say about that? Uh, uh, actually, no. I had put a note on the board that I needed to step away for a second, so I didn't hear that last bit. Oh. Okay. I tried to use the message board. <laughs> this is this is exactly what we were talking about. I used the uh, uh, restroom, and nobody responded, and I had to check out. Yeah, I, I see it in the private our private chat now. Uh, okay, well, let's just go on then. If um, all right, then it says. Uh, I'm interested in the fruit he's talking about here. 
What's uh, that? I was trying to figure out the fruit thing here. Uh, that I might have some fruit also among you, even as among other Gentiles. Uh, what, what verse did you go to here? Just 13. 13. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that's that's how, when I see the word separated, that's how I, uh, I, I think Paul had that in mind. But let's continue on then. It says, um, in verse 2, it says, which he had promised before, all four by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Uh, okay, so Renee. Paul oh, yeah. Him. He's always Paul. confirming that that Jesus's death was according to the Scriptures and that he was risen according to the Scriptures. He says it twice in the gospel presentation. So everything he does is confirmed by what the prophets already foretold. He always comes out with that to confirm this gospel is according to the scriptures mm -hmm. okay yeah we know that uh jesus uh after the resurrection he met people on the road to emmaus and it says that jesus did the same thing he took them through the scriptures and at that point did we have uh the gospel accounts did we have the epistles or any or book of revelation or anything uh, no but we had isaiah <laughs> yeah. yeah so when it says that he took them through <coughs> the uh the scriptures it, it can only mean the the law and the prophets the old testament scriptures and and said look what it said about jesus that's and, what i want to do that movie on old yeah. testament him in the old testament yeah, that would be wonderful. i have a playlist on that titled uh, uh the bloody trail uh pictures and shadows of jesus's blood atonement oh i'd love i'll, I'll look at that um so jesus did that and Paul did the same thing. As I said, he'd go to a city. He didn't just go right to the Gentiles. He always went first to the synagogue and would go through the scriptures saying, this is talking about Jesus. All these prophetic verses about this coming Savior, Jesus is the one. Yeah, and he always says, uh, hey, so these are testifying of me. These are talking mm -hmm. about me. And then when he was in the synagogue, Remember, he said, uh, this day is this prophecy, the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And they lost their minds. So mm -hmm. they know what according to the scriptures meant. Like the Jews knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. So when Paul writes here in verse 2, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures, uh, this is right in line with, we know, Paul's methodology. He'd yep. always go through the scriptures and say, which the prophets in the scriptures talked about and so um starting at genesis 3. Mm -hmm. and then verse 3 says concerning his son jesus christ our lord let me see what it says there uh verse 3 in the amplified by the way it says uh, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the sacred scriptures the good news regarding his son who as to the flesh his human nature was born a descendant of david to fulfill the covenant promises okay uh, i like how that was put because it didn't give him wiggle room to say see he's just a man mm -hmm. yeah yeah they are uh, the the amplified most of the time and quite happy with the way they amplify a point to to make you understand it a little bit better uh but it says here um concerning his son christ our lord i wanted to see him the lord is capitalized and i've made a big point about this recently uh i don't know if someone wants to go look at this in uh the greek if you can see if my point holds out or not but i believe when paul is talking using the word lord or when the word lord is used in the bible or re referring to jesus it's not talking about lord in the sense that he is your master and you are his servant as in lordship salvation it's ta talking about he is your lord meaning he is your god lord thank you god. yes i agree he yes, yes. that's why he told the romans that you must confess him as lord it doesn't mean your master over your life. It's Thank you. your Lord, the King of Kings, the God of gods, the name above all names. You have many lords, he says. You have many gods, but he is the God, the Lord. So I agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, and then it says in verse 4, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Okay. You want to amplify that? Brother Cripps, are you talking? I was going to say, uh, we, we went over uh, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Did you? Uh, did oh, no, I don't okay, I, I went over that too quickly. Go ahead. Tell me your no thoughts. Problem. Yeah, so uh, it says, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So first of all, you have what Renee referred to as um, seeing the difference between the flesh and the spirit, and that's made very clear, made very clear in that verse. Seed of David just means, uh, obviously, from from the lineage of David. It's it's very clear there and very simple, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the seed of David would be the, the uh, gene genealogy of David. Uh, and we know that uh, the scripture points out that uh, he had been descendant of uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David. Those are singled out. And Judah. Uh, and although he's a descendant of Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. So even though he's a seed of Abraham, he's also before Abraham. Yes. Yeah. That's the God part. Yeah. <laughs> That's the uh, God yeah. before he was made flesh. <laughs> okay, so let me let me read this in the KJV and then the Amplified, and you'll see how the Amplified might help a person understand this a little bit better. It says, verse th three, uh, starting with verse three, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Uh, now, three and four in the Amplified says, um, uh, the, the good news regarding his son, who as to the flesh, his human nature, was born a descendant of David to fulfill the covenant promises. And as to his divine nature, according to the spirit of holiness, was openly designated to be the son of God with power in a triumphant and miraculous way. Yeah, I, I think it's confirming both his humanity and his divinity in those verses, just like you said, Luke. Mm -hmm. I, I think that is good when he says, declare to be a son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, divine, by the resurrection from the dead. And, and how is he declared with power? Because he rose from the dead. This proves that he is God. He had power over death. And it says he's declared to be the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. His very resurrection proves that he is the son of God with power. Mm -hmm. Amen, 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 amen. Yeah, that resurrection, I, I, I did a, I have a playlist titled um, More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. It's a little paperback book. And it's almost entirely about the resurrection as a proof for, for uh, Jesus. Uh, well, we all and, rest on that, don't it, Luke? Yeah, uh, but the it, it, he promised that this resurrection would be the ultimate sign. They kept on demanding a sign. The sign and, of Jonah. Yes, he, he, and he said, uh, I'll give you the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the whale, belly of the whale, for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the day, a heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And early in, in uh, God's, John's gospel, He's asked um, for a sign, and he says, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. And they said, how can you do that? It took our fathers 40 years to build it. And it says, well, he was referring to his death burial. Again, the look at the yeah. consistent blindness of the religious leaders. Mm -hmm. Every time he's speaking of something heavenly or spiritual, they go right to the carnal. But let, let's let's look at the uh, the result of that bodily resurrection of Jesus. The apostles were hiding out for their lives, thinking that they were going to the, the authorities would come for them next and kill them. Uh, and and I think historically that proves that they they were. If you watch the movie Risen, it's a great movie. I mean, you being from Hollywood, uh, Renee, uh, uh, if you haven't seen that, you need. Yeah, to see I have. That. I, I that's, like. That's I like one of the best things about about uh, Jesus and Christianity I've ever seen produced by Hollywood. Uh, Risen, uh, but. 
Here they are, afraid for their lives, hiding out, not be, even believing in the resurrection. Otherwise, they wouldn't be hiding out. You know, they'd be up celebrating. Hey, he'll be back in a couple of days, you know. Uh, but then when he came back and he showed himself and they ate with him and they touched him and stuff, they went from cowards to the most bold preachers at the cost of their lives because the resurrection did what it says here. Not it's just that, but Paul was killing the Christians. Yeah. He was, he was person. And the next thing you know, he's out boldly proclaiming it. Something happened. What? He saw the risen Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it says here in verse four and declared to be the son of God. And it says by the resurrection from the dead. And in the Amplified says, and as to his divine nature, according to the spirit of holiness, was openly designated to be the son of God with power in a triumphant and miraculous way by his resurrection from the dead. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and verse five in the KJV says, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Uh, okay, I'm a little confused. Help me out. It says, by whom we have received grace and apostleship. Uh, well, he's he's writing to the church in Rome. Is there an apostle in, in Rome uh, that I don't know about? Uh, uh, he, he, he's identifying himself as an apostle, but it sounds like he's saying, we have received grace and apostleship. Uh, what, what am I missing there? Maybe, maybe he could be talking about all the apostles. He could be talking about all the apostles. Well, in that sentence, because he, he's using grace and apostleship in the same sentence, I automatically jump to the conclusion that that's straight from God. Uh, the, who do we receive uh, grace from most is God, and who who is capable of making us an apostle in the first place? The calling to be an apostle. So yeah, he, maybe maybe he's right. Maybe the we, because he's saying we've received grace, and then he adds an apostleship. As Amen. He he received the apostleship, but he put we because they all received grace. Maybe that's it. You know, like when it says repent, and be baptized and you'll be saved. And then mm -hmm. it says that if you don't, it, it's no, it says believe and be baptized and you'll be saved. But it said if you don't believe, you won't. But it didn't say if you don't believe and don't get baptized, but they threw baptism in with it. But baptism is a part of what saves you. See what I mean? Yeah. Like you kind of threw it all together. Maybe. Yeah, because he's certainly not saying that. Uh, all the people who read the letter are also apostles. No. no. Right. But God is the one. I think uh, Jason's right on that. He's saying God gives us the grace and is the one that sends us to be apostles. He's the assigner of the apostles. I think that might be what he's saying. Yeah. Amen. Okay. okay. And then it says, in, um, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ? Hey, you know what? I wanted to mention something. People don't bring this up very often, Luke, but in the Old Testament, like around the Tower of Babel, God separated the nations and put an angel over the 70 nations and set Israel aside as for himself. And then you'll see that the angels were corrupt leaders and that's why he says how long you're going to die like prince. You're going to die like men and fall like princes. Remember when he's talking to the angels that are overseers of each one of these nations and these wicked people were given the judgment of having evil little G gods over them to worship the stars that fell from heaven. It was yeah. a judgment on them. So now when he says to the nations, he's now coming as God to take back what's his from those pagan little G-gods. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I remember hearing something about this uh, this angels over the nations just recently. I mean, obviously, you know, I've read it. I've read the Bible many times, so I know oh, I've read it. On that. A lot of times we read something and it doesn't. It just doesn't stand out as really significant. But I think I'm going to do something on that. You're mentioning it. Uh, do you know where, where that is? About the angels. Uh, the gosh, I, maybe Ezekiel or something. I'll have to look. It's when he's fussing at those guys. Yeah. But there's also when he divides them up at the Tower of Babel. I believe that's when it actually happens. Okay. Um, 
So uh, let me read it in the Amplify here. It says, uh, it is through him that we have received grace and our apostleship to promote obedience to the faith and make disciples for his namesake among all the Gentiles. So that has uh, 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 rather the nations, it has all the Gentiles. Uh, let me see. And then it says, and you also are among those who are called of Jesus Christ to belong to him. The problem, of course, is uh, when it says for obedience to the faith among all nations. What's the potential problem we have there? People think obeying the truth is obeying some kind of law, but it's not. It's, it's remaining steadfast in the doctrine of Christ. That it's by God's grace and it's because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that we have eternal life. So obedience to the faith would mean to stand firm in what Christ has done for us for eternal life. And that all nations will be blessed with this gospel message. So obedience is sticking to that doctrine of Christ. Mm -hmm. Well said. Brother Cripps, have you, have you ever noticed that when you have a word like obedience or obey pop up in the scriptures? That there is a group of people that will see that word and all of a sudden they jump for glee. Obey, Deans, obey. Now they try to take that and to support their heresy of lordship salvation. Can you see you see how that the word obedience and obey was they, they want to jump on those words? Uh, I do indeed. It's 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 fodder for them for sure. Absolutely. It it uh props up their their false uh gospel. Mm -hmm. They want to make it seem like that's that's the thing that saves you, is the obedience part, and that's not what it is at all. Yeah, yeah. Obedience well, to the faith. That that particular yeah. phrase there can really it, by just... faith. Faith. The just shall live by faith, and that's obedience to the faith, the faith of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, and plus if it was by obedience to the law, it says that we're saved by the obedience of one, and that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, as for me, uh, there's um, there's certain key words that when I see them, all of a sudden I get excited. Uh, if it's a word that really is, uh, we, we, we can clearly see, supports our doctrine. And then I also see when a word uh, like the, that exists right there, how I say, oh, no, another opportunity for a lordship heretic to pull this out of contact. Oh, they love that word, obey, and obey. Amen. And they're going to twist that around. Amen. Okay. All right. So now verse uh, the seven. Luke, we yeah. shouldn't be afraid of those words like repent and obey. We should boldly proclaim them with the proper understanding. You know? Yeah. Yeah, we shouldn't. And that's why when I see the word, it stands out to me and I wanted let's let's address it because I know that somebody listening right now or somebody who listens later or just reads the Bible and sees that verse, they're going to jump on that word. And if we don't take that right now, the time to say, wait a second, I anticipate someone's going to misapply this word now, uh, obedience. And, and so we want to nip it in the bud. And don't let them misuse it. Um. Uh, and then it says, um, verse 7 says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, this is seven verses, one period, only one sentence, actually. Uh, and it's all really part of a salutation. He says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from our God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is all seven verses is part of his initial salutation or greeting. Isn't that amazing? Nobody else is excited about that as I am, I guess. Sorry, my hand wasn't on the thing. I was going, yeah, and I couldn't. My thing wasn't on. My microphone wasn't on. I, do, I, do, I to, do I have to say, can I get an amen? Yeah, say, say it like that. I'll be sure to respond. I'm scrambling for my mouse. I'm like, ah, it's not on. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was really distracted at that moment. My apologies. Okay. Um, 
All right, so we've done seven verses to, to finish the very first sentence. His actual greeting is all that we've we've done. Uh, apart was from his greeting, seven verses. <laughs> yes, that's what it is. Seven verses to make one sentence and one greeting. Okay. Um, all right, now because uh, we, we schedule this from uh, 9.30 to 11 p.m. Eastern time, and uh, we have we started a little bit, a few minutes late. So we've covered our 90 minutes, and this is probably a good point. We read the seven verses to complete one sentence, and then we went back through it more carefully. And uh, so all that really to just get Paul's greeting. Um, uh, so uh, let me let me do this. Ask you guys just to kind of give me your your summary of uh, anything that uh, you want to recap or emphasize uh, for tonight well he confirms his humanity and his divinity in the greeting confirms a, a why because he rose from the dead and that all of this was prophesied by the prophets and that god is uh offering them grace to all the gentile nations now and that uh he's called them uh so i mean he said a lot in just a greeting yeah yeah uh brother brother cripps uh you, you might say brother luke i mean what how can i sum up just one sentence <laughs> but uh as renee said there's a lot in that one sentence that greeting but uh let, let me just ask for your thoughts on, on the introduction before we got in the scriptures i know that you you didn't maybe see the value of that, but but give me your thoughts on that, and also the the, the discussion of the first seven verses. Okay, I, I I can I can try to say it in uh, three words. I want more. Okay, good. Very I good. want more. <laughs> Very good. You're allowed to say more than three words, but I, it's good oh, if, you can, if you can be uh, profound with and succinct. No. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Um, I I think it's a good introduction, and when I say I want more, I I feel like uh, going into uh, more detail. I hope I get a chance to come back and uh, finish up the rest of this, at least the rest of this uh, chapter. I would love that. So I'm left in anticipation. That's all I have to say. All right, brother. Well, um, going back to the discussion before we got into scripture uh the idea of trying to learn about uh you know who what when where why um regarding this book um, uh, i anticipate and i think i think some of these points were made in that uh, part of the discussion that this book there's an awful lot to it it is the longest of the epistles i i, I was I think I read that earlier. It's the longest of all his epistles. And there's an awful lot in it. And I know that when we get into uh, uh, the next, the, the first, second uh, chapters, and uh, there are a certain section of verses there that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put forth the idea that Paul is using a oratory technique known as prosopopoeia. And uh, ask everybody to consider that as a possibility. And then, of course, I anticipate when we get to, uh, you know, versus, uh, you know, three and on, uh, we're going to have some people concerned, like like Matthias has uh, made a lot of videos about the Romans road and how some people are misusing that uh, and not uh, and giving people a false gospel because they're not explaining some of the verses that, that are needed. Uh, and then we got we go up to Romans nine, one of the most controversial books in the Bible. That's what what that's what Calvinists hang their hat on. And there's just so much in this to look forward to. And Romans 11 about the future of the nation of Israel. Yeah. And, and uh, Celine asked me to tell you guys, because we were talking about the Old Testament fulfillment, and the shadows and the types. Uh, what was your playlist on that again? Uh, uh, the Bloody Trail. Okay, the Bloody Trail. Mine's just types and shadows. Uh, and... She met a Muslim girl at school, and so she told about Jesus and, you know, the gospel, but really showed her the Old Testament because Muslims seem to believe pretty much the Old Testament. 
So uh, she wanted me to tell you guys that she did that today. Does your son have a Tesla ball? Is that what that is? Oh yeah, we we he got this at King's Dominion playing those arcade games. He got thousands of tickets. Oh, nice. arcade Very games. Cool. So he got a, a nice toy there. Very That's cool games. I could have bought one for less than two hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you could have probably nineteen hundred winning the prize, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the free gift that you have to earn. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was fun though. Yeah, you start out the first thing you win is like a little comb or something, and you build. Yeah, your yeah, yeah. You spend like fifty bucks, and you can get like a rubber ball with a dinosaur. Well, let's, see, uh, let's see if there's anything in the chat room before we uh, finish up for tonight, just to see if there's anything that we ought to address. It does not seem. I know Bible expositor. I I noticed earlier when we were talking about Bible translations, he made a comment that uh, he's never met a KJV onlyist. Who didn't eventually get really ugly with him? Uh, he, he phrased it a little bit differently, but at some point they always like, get real ugly about it. You know, uh, I don't know why. If someone wants to be a KJV only, uh, they can't just settle on themselves being KJV only and let someone else do what they want. You know, yeah, well, why, that's how I am. I'm KJV preferred. That's I don't force it on people. Yeah. Why? Why do you have to try to impose it on others if? You know, I, I don't care what, uh, as long as a person has the right doctrines, I don't really care what the translation they, they're using. Yeah. Hey, uh, Luke, we got a prayer request. It looks like Anna's husband was in a wreck and injured his neck. So we wanted to ask everybody to pray for Anna's husband tonight. Okay. Uh, uh, Anna, is, uh, Anna is who in the chat room? What's Anna? It's just Anna is the name of the... Uh, I the thought church. I saw Anna earlier. Yeah, it oh, might be meticulous. Yeah, uh, Mark, smile, baby. yeah, um, paste over, uh, brother Mark. He says, Paul is going to be meticulous and repetitive as he establishes every point. Uh, I, uh, I agree, and, and I and that's one of the things I love about Paul. He, he reminds me of like the greatest attorney that's making a closing argument that, that, that systematically presents all the evidence in a systematic step-by-step -step process, kind of building up a wall, an inescapable conclusion. And that's what he does in his, uh, in Galatians is like that more than any other book I, I know. And then Hebrews, that's why, that's why I think Paul wrote Hebrews. Uh, I think it's he, Hebrews is taking Galatians a step further and saying, Hey, I told you about, uh, don't, don't let them impose, um, uh, circumcision and the Sabbath things on, and Jude, all these things in Judaism on you. And now I'm telling you, don't let them impose the animal sacrifices on you too. You, you can't go back to that. Right. But the way that he, the way those two books are written, it seems so meticulous as Case Dover says here, meticulous and just building up a case. And I call it ratcheting down, making a point and tightening, it, tightening it. I agree. And it's unfortunate because it's those books that they'll take a verse out of context, which is making it a huge point. The whole point is, is, is narrowed down in the beginning of that book. Let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works. That's the whole book of Hebrews right there. Yeah. Turn from dead works of the temple system to Christ. And he's doing that little by little, getting it down, 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 confirming this, confirming this shadow, confirming this was done, this was done. And people will take one verse like uh, if we willfully sin after a sin, you know, instead of it, the sin being not, you know, remaining in your dead works. Um, so uh, I, I think it's important what you just said, that it's all one giant build up and then it gets narrowed down bit by bit. And then you can't just take one little verse out of the context and you can make it say whatever you want. I'm still in that Luke ratcheting it down. <laughs> what right? do you mean? You're still in it. I'm stealing it from you. Ratcheting oh, you're, it oh, down. You're stealing it. I thought you said you're still in it. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> stealing it. Good. Yeah. That's a good. I, I actually learned that from uh, Jim Weber known as Bible Jim. Uh, he's a real famous street preacher that I worked with for a long time, but uh, yeah, that, uh, that's how he expressed it, and uh, I, so I guess I ought to mention his name uh, since uh, I'm using his phrase. 
Well, it's really a, it's so true that, that Paul makes this conclusion inescapable that don't you dare add your filthy works to Jesus' blood, or yeah. otherwise it's tainted. It's and it's it become it's become adulterated and poisonous. Yes. Bible, Bible expositor in the chat uh, chat room. Amen. He put with a change of priesthood comes a change of the law. Yeah, and with the death of the testator is the death of the testament. So mm -hmm. since Jesus died and he's the one that made the covenant, and by the way, that's another confirmation of Jesus's divinity. If he is the one who made the testament, but he died and so no, the testament's over. If yeah. he wasn't alive before, how could he have made that testament, that covenant that is no longer in place? Because it says the death of the testator must occur for the testament to be over. Yeah. So he's the one that made that covenant. Yeah, if there's anybody who's not old, uh, you might not relate to uh, have related it this way, but you know, I'm at the point in my life where I said, Hey, I need to have a will, a last will and testament. So I wrote one up and I've got it here, and it's uh, and, but guess what? It's not in effect until the testator dies, and that's the uh, that's the point that's being made uh, with that kind of language is that this New Testament can only go into effect uh, uh, after the death of the testator, which is Jesus. So um, it's, that's the kind of language that it's what it's really uh, uh, like a picture of your, your uh, Jesus's last will and testament. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I guess uh, and anybody want to say any last words here before uh, I don't want to say last words when we're talking about last will and testament now. <laughs> it's okay. no, I'll do, I got to uh, do a couple of prayers for viewers. I'll be doing them on the channel. If not tonight, tomorrow, but we're a lot of people are headed over to talking doctrines chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me, let me, the last thing I'll say to everybody watching now is that we started doing these uh, daily fellowship live uh, uh, fellowship room um, on Monday. So Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it's, we've done it. And I've been in there each day having a lot of fun. And so uh, it starts at um, 3 p.m. my time. So that would be uh, 6 at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it, if you want to be on the list, ask Matthias and he'll send you the link each day and you just click on that and you're right in the room and you can have texting or video or audio or all of it. And, uh, and you'll get to actually talk to some people that have been in the chat room and it's far better. I really enjoy getting to actually speak to someone. I mean, hear them speak. I speak enough, I, you know, but, but uh, to be able to hear someone, you guys in the chat room, hear your voice. And, and if you dare put your camera on and let me look at you, I feel like when I hear someone and see them, I know them better than just texting. Yep. It's yeah, it's good stuff. For me. It's good stuff. And I like what you said, raise your hand and go like this, because it gets hard when there's 15 people in there, not just talking, but you got another 10 in the chat yeah. that aren't live, you know? Hey, yes. Luke, who knows? Someday you might see me on, on camera. I'm, I might actually get a camera just for you. So that, you're so not this like is... the elephant man, are you? No, I bet you're like Brad Pitt. And just <laughs> no, humble. No, you're I like have... Brad Pitt and he just doesn't want anybody to see how handsome he is. We're all going to faint and be no. distracted. No, know? it's it's not Brad Pitt or, or the elephant man. <laughs> not, <laughs> nothing like that. That's yeah. your choice. Yeah. Well, 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 I I do look forward to that day. I, I actually feel that, I mean, some people, maybe it's just a question of they want their privacy. Other people, maybe they're shy. Maybe they, uh, I, I don't know, for whatever reason, if you do turn your camera on and your microphone on, uh, I would love to, I would love to have that. But you don't, don't feel like you have to do it for my sake. Luke, I promise you, I, someday I will do that. Uh, really, for me, mainly, it's just that I'm a radio guy, and I always wanted to do radio. So yeah. it's it's mainly my voice that um, is the biggest thing. But I, I think as I go and my confidence builds, I think probably eventually I will get a camera. Okay, I look forward to that. Uh, someone told me once that, uh, Luke, you have the perfect face for radio. <laughs> no, you don't. How can we see your happy dance on the radio? Okay. Uh, all right, then. I guess we'll say good night to everybody. Uh, don't forget to join us uh, every Sunday. Um, that's uh, 
2 p.m. Pacific or 5 p.m. Eastern time for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And every Wednesday night, as I said, uh, that's 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, this program tonight, will we'll continue through these epistles. It's going to take us, get through all the Pauline epistles. will take a year or two, who knows how long. Uh, so I'm excited about going through that very slowly and carefully with, with everybody. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, we also have a True Story Live with uh, Brother Cripps here, his program. That's every Sunday night. Uh, what is that? 6 p.m. Pacific time. That would be 9 p.m. Eastern, I think. Uh, so, And someday we'll get maybe Sister Renee will actually have her own live streams. Maybe not. But she's so busy just producing more videos every day. I don't know how she's able to produce so much content. Oh, and look, I, I, right, I wrote my trailer. Now I got to write the whole screenplay for the. I love that the cat's eyes. They're beautiful. They're blue. Yeah, you're pretty blue eyed, Simon. Yeah, yeah, he has a purple red scab on his arm. Yeah, he's got a boo boo. I think we found a dead mouse by the food dish, and he's got a huge like bite mark under his neck. I think the 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 mouse went out fighting. Oh yeah. I don't think Rigel could have done that kind of damage. I mean, it's pretty deep and it's really big, right under his mouth. Wow, I hope he doesn't get infected. Yeah, well, he's had all his shots. He's spoiled. He's good. Okay, so everybody in the chat room, uh, thanks for uh, joining us tonight. And uh, uh, Renee and Brother Cripps, uh, thank you for, for being with me. And, and uh, I'll look forward to next time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.